Welcome back, welcome back. Eurozone countries have agreed tough new rules which should prevent another financial crisis and assure, at the same time, financial stability. Earlier this year, Greece was facing possible bankruptcy, as you may recall, until it got a 120 billion euro EU bailout. Then Spain and Portugal and Ireland came into the headlines because they also have huge debts. Now leaders have agreed on a new regime, just last night, in fact, and uh, there'll be a new permanent crisis fund. And countries that borrow and spend too much will be fined. The bad news? It may need a new European treaty or an adapted one to get in place. And at the same time, it could then for mean some more referenda all over Europe. Anyway, with me is Dennis McShane, the UK's former Europe minister, who has come here direct from the dentist, showing once again his political stamina and his physical stamina uh, as good as ever. Welcome. Welcome, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, now, this action overnight seems very, um, very dynamic in a way, and it's, it's got unanimity in the first half of it, but not so much in the second half of changing the treaty, which Germany is leading on, yeah? Yes, it is very dramatic. It's a very big step forward for common European economic policy making, surveillance, having to submit budgets for discussion beforehand, because we can't really ever again, if we want a common European Eurozone area or just a common European uh, market, allow countries like Greece to go down the crazy road, some of the others with uh, uh, housing bubbles like in Spain and Ireland, and nearly bring the whole thing down. But this is uh, remarkable. It's come so hard. It's come so fast. There is unanimity. Big question about whether a new treaty or a change to the treaty will be needed, because then, as you say, that could require countries like Ireland and others to go mm. down the referendum road, which always messes things up. And is this... Um the big guys uh, getting together to bully the smaller countries, in a sense. Will, will the smaller countries be feeling this is a France-Germany move and they don't care about us? No, well, they do on, care about us. No, on, on, on the contrary. I mean, it's smaller countries like the, the, the Netherlands, yeah. for example, Luxembourg, Belgium, uh, Sweden, who are the most adamant that we need stricter economic governance in Europe. You can't allow countries just to borrow, 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 or in the case of Greece, never extract a penny's worth of tax from the rich or the middle class or even the poor and pretend that they could run huge deficits. So this is about now bringing Europe more into line, one country with another. And I think the East European countries, the new member states, will be keen on this because they actually run much more rigorous budgets than even we do in Britain, let alone in France. And what, and what about this thing of fining or penalties or punishments for countries that break the new rules and so on? I mean, what form will the spanking take? Well, I'm slightly holding my breath on that because those threats and the hints of fines and sanctions were in the previous what's called st uh, Stability and Growth Pact. But the moment... France and Germany in the last 10 years suddenly found their growth wasn't good, but they wanted to keep up their public spending. So they went through the red lines that had previously existed. And because they're big boys, nobody took any action uh, against them. When Britain started to go break the EU rules, because although we're not in the Eurozone, we still have to obey the broad economic rules. Again, we got away with it. So the Germans in particular, they passed a constitutional amendment saying that they cannot run massively unbalanced budgets. They're saying that's the way Europe has to go. It's a massive interference, if you like, in what you know, the last 20, 30, 40 years has been things go bad, countries press the borrowing button, the deficit button, and hope for the best. This is now saying, no, you've got to plan and structure your economy in a more rigorous way. That is a different situation. But is today the Eurozone or the Euro itself safer today than it was yesterday? Much more so. I think around the world, the big investors that still want to put their money into euros from the Gulf states, from China, the new emerging economies, they're not sure about the ever-devaluing dollar. Uh, they like Europe with half a billion 
uh, people all sharing in the same market, all buying, all creating a middle class lifestyle. Uh, and that's why the money's coming into Europe. And this is a big global market signal uh, that the euro as a currency will be a stronger, more stable as a result of uh, last night's decision. Would you say that in fact, in terms of Greece, that there was a chance of a of a roll-on disaster at the time of Greece? Or was there always, now they're, now they're prepared for it, but even though they weren't prepared for it then, that it was never really any danger that Greece would bring the system well, there was down. A lot, was there? Not the whole system. There's a lot of se serious talk about default. You know, that's what Argentina did. That's what Russia's done in the 1990s. When you just simply say, we can't pay our debts, we're not going to pay them go away, we'll give you 10% of the money that you owe, or uh, devaluation by pulling out of the euro, bringing in the drachma, but that would leave all of Greeks' debt still denominated in euros, but then having to pay far more back in drachmas. And I think the Greek government under Mr. Papandreou was very tough and brave. I mean, they've had to face the most awful pressure. Remember, it's a socialist government, they say to the union, sorry boys, the party's over. You can go on strike, you can protest, you can't get any more money. You're going to have to start paying taxes, you're going to have to work longer, and Greece has got to become a modern uh, economy. Stop telling lies to itself. So the dangers were there, uh, but I think Germany and other countries realize that if we start disintegrating the euro into liras and pesetas and French francs and Deutschmarks, that then will bring the great common market project to a pretty juddering halt. But that would be a, a big, bigger step. And at the moment, it's a, it's a day of good news. Then at the moment. I think good news, but we've still got to get, because to make this legally binding, in other words, you've got to do it. It's not a voluntary uh, call before the headmaster, and, well, if you don't really like him, you tell him, sorry, I'm going away, I'm taking no notice. For it to be legally binding, that sounds as if a new treaty has to be in place. It will still cover Britain, even if we're not in the Eurozone. Mr. Cameron, for example, has spent five years saying he wants referendums in any new treaty change. It's going to be a tricky for him with his own backbenchers, but other countries too normally have referendums on new treaties, and it'll be a lot of fine playing by the European Union lawyers and legal experts, I think, to say we can do this, but it's a tweak of the treaty rather than a brand new treaty, but the German Constitutional Court is very tough and strict, may yet stamp its foot, so we're not there yet. But this is an important decision, and Europe showing itself coming together at a time of huge global instability. Dennis, thank you very much indeed. There we have the good news, basically, that they may all, they may all live happily ever after. Until the next crisis. Until the next crisis, that's right. After the break, two members of two of the world's greatest dynasties together on one sofa for the first time talking families, though not necessarily happy families or risk-free families. Don't go away, and neither will they.